Good afternoon and welcome uh, to the 18th annual Jack H. Berman Lecture. Uh, the previous 17 lectures have included only one woman, so we're really celebrating the second. Next year's uh, lecture is also with our third woman, just to let you know. Just a word about Jack Berman. He is a graduate uh, in 1951 of the Western Reserve, not Case Western Reserve, uh, University School of Medicine. He went into private practice, and his focus was in an not only in internal medicine, but uh, hematology, oncology. And he always championed uh, new ideas and wanted to exemplify that, he and his family, in creating this lecture series. Uh, and so it's to his credit and his family's credit that this exists. In addition, we lost Barbara, his wife, a little over a year ago from pancreatic cancer. Uh, but she was a force in her own right and really was a great advocate for this lecture series. Uh, she is a school of the Mandel, uh, the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences from Case Western Reserve University, has several relatives that are Case Western graduates as well, many of whom are physicians or PhD graduates. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, our speaker today is Sandra Swain. Sandra is currently Associate Dean for Research Development at the Georgetown University Medical Center and is also Vice President of the MedStar uh, hospital system of at least 10 uh, hospitals, she told me this morning, a genetic medicine program. Uh, she is Professor of Mer uh, Medicine at Georgetown University and an Adjunct Professor of Medicine at the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences. She started uh, with her undergraduate training and degree from Uni University of North Carolina. She went on to the University of Florida where she received her MD. And she completed a residency at Vanderbilt in 1983 and a fellowship in hematology oncology at the NIH, uh, the National Cancer Institute. She served at the uh, NIH for several years uh, attaining the ultimate uh, position as deputy branch chief for medical, uh, the medical branch of the Center for Cancer Research. And uh, then she moved on to Georgetown and uh, MedStar as indicated. Her own research interests include translational research and clinical trials focused on metastatic and inflammatory breast cancer, adjuvant therapy for breast cancer, cardiotoxicity related to the chemotherapies that are given, and healthcare disparities. She has received funding from the NIH, Susan G. Komen Foundation, Breast Cancer Research Foundation, and the Avon Foundation. Incredibly so, she has published over 280 articles and is internationally recognized as a leader in the field of breast cancer research and treatment. Uh, and uh, among other things, she's gotten the NCI Mentor uh, Award and the Merit Award there as well. So really well-renowned in terms of what she does. She's involved in a number of committees, both nationally and internationally. She was telling me she's going to Oxford, Oxford University this weekend for <coughs> uh, a compilation of data related to breast cancer, uh, information, et cetera. So she's really involved in that as well. So without further ado, we'd like to have Sandra come forth. I'd like to present you with a plaque in appreciation of your uh, being the 18th annual lecture for the Jack H. Berman uh, Lecture Series. Thank, Thank you very you much. Well, I'm really very, very honored to be here and really to dedicate this to the Bermans who both unfortunately passed from a very, very difficult cancer, pancreatic cancer. And I really, I'm hoping that with all of our advances that we're making and have made in the last several years that we can be saying very soon in the future that we're not going to be people, see people dying of pancreatic cancer. And I think for me, 
it's the reason that I do what I do is because I don't want to see this happen again. And, and I would also like to dedicate it to Koki Roberts, who just died a couple of hours ago, who was someone I knew well in Washington, and she died of breast cancer. So it, it's an example for me of why I keep doing what I do. I do not want to have to say that again about any, any person. It's very sad for, for all of us. So in ASCO, uh, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, which is a big organization for oncologists, I was the president actually in 2013. And the, the title for last year's meeting I think is really important, Expanding the Reach of Precision Medicine. And we've seen huge advances happen in oncology in the last, I'd say, 10 years because of precision medicine. Now, I've trained a long time ago, as you heard, um, where we had very few options for patients. Now we're making really discoveries almost every day. You know, immunotherapy is really big. Patients, people like Jimmy Carter are alive with brain metastasis because of immunotherapy. I mean, we're really moving forward at, at a pretty rapid pace. And the Hallmarks of Cancer by Hanahan and Weinberg really describe as kind of a classic paper for oncology. First published in 2000 and then updated a few years ago, initially was just six hallmarks of cancer, and now they've added things in there, such as tumor-promoting inflammation, um, things like immunology, and all the other aspects that, can, that are involved in cancer. So this is a very important basic paper for oncology. Now, I'm going to specifically talk about breast cancer because that's my main area of research, and just to give you some background, the leading cause um, of incidence for breast cancer in the U.S. or for cancer in the U.S. is breast cancer. It's about 30 percent or 268,000 um, predicted for this year. It's the second cause of cancer death, about 41,000 or so, with lung cancer being the first. So it's still a, a significant problem in that we still have breast cancer deaths, as I mentioned, even today with Cokie's um, passing. And it tends to be longer. Patients are doing well for a longer period of time, but still we have mortality. Now, if you look at the trends in female breast cancer deaths shown here, you can see what's very nice in that the trends are going down, and that started in about 1990 or so. And, and really, the trends are not just due to screening. We know that that is some part of it, that we're picking up earlier cancers, but it's definitely the therapies have improved um, very dramatically over the last 20 or so years. Now, if you look at two different time periods, on the left side is between 1986 and 92, and those are different, sub, just different subtypes of breast cancer. Specifically, the, the highest peak there are those patients that have um, the ER negative, HER2 positive in 1986 to 1992. Those patients died almost really immediately. They did not do well. But it's actually changed when you look at the next um, decade or so, 2004 to 8, that the mortality peak is less and many less patients are dying. Now, that, all, that preceded some of the therapies we have now but it, it probably also has to do with earlier detection in some of these cases. So you can see that there's progress that has been made over the last 20 or 30 years, but it's still, you know, and it's still not enough. We still have work to do. So I'm going to talk to you about a very specific type of breast cancer. It's about 15 or 20 percent. And I have spent, you know, the last 30 or so years working in this area, and I think it's a great story because our, our first biomarker that we had for breast cancer was estrogen receptor, and that was really discovered many years ago, 100 and some years ago. The second really good biomarker is HER2. And I wanted to start it, which I didn't start the HER2 story at all, but just to show a picture, it's kind of this lecture I, I'm kind of looking at is what has happened in my career, and we had some discussions about that since I've been here. And it, Bernie Fisher is the person that's standing behind me who is really my greatest mentor, a surgeon, 
who, how many of you heard of Bernie Fisher? Only the people in the front who have gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> and that's sad to me, because he is a giant. He is really the person, he and, and a, an Italian um, surgeon, are the, the people who really ha changed um, breast cancer for patients and really allowed patients now to have conservative therapy. And he did one of the very, if not the very first clinical trial, randomized trial in breast cancer. And he's a surgeon. He was trying to do less surgery because he realized that it was systemic. It wasn't just local. Like He, he didn't believe in the Halsteadian model where you just take it off and remove as much as possible. That, that wasn't going, going to um, cure it. So this was at the end of my fellowship, and I really, I can't believe I'm even sitting in this picture with these, all these great people because it was really a great time to, to be around them. Now, Bill McGuire was someone who, in our laboratory at NIH, worked closely with Bill McGuire in San Antonio, and he was very prescient in that he developed a tumor bank that was annotated for breast cancer, that was his main area. And he would publish a lot of things for prognostic markers in breast cancer, but none of them were really things that actually could be druggable um, for a long time, until he met Dennis Flayman, who gave him, the, in the collaboration, tumors from his tumor bank. And Dennis Flayman, with his work in his laboratory, determined that HER2 was an oncogene or something that was a driver of breast cancer. And really, it really started from there in 1987 when he published a couple of papers in Science, noting that this was this is a very poor prognostic marker. These patients did not do well, but yet it was a good um, druggable marker for biomarker for treatment. And then it, it went on from there with a collaboration with Genentech. And I forgot to mention at the beginning, I was supposed to mention that I do have conflict of interest in that I do work with Genentech, Daiichi, Sankyo, um, Pfizer, and a lot of the companies that, that do make these drugs um, at minimal amount, but I do do that. So I'm sorry, I forgot to mention it. But he worked with um, Genentech where they developed an antibody that actually has changed the whole way we treat HER2 positive breast cancer. In fact, Dennis Flayman just got an award from the NIH for his work that he's done. So he really did it. And when, when you look at <coughs> HER2, it is a family of receptors. There are four receptors as shown here. And um, HER1 is EGFR. HER2 does not have um, a ligand, as you can see there. HER3 does not have an active tyrosine kinase domain. You can see there where the X is. And then HER4. And to activate or signal down these receptors, you really need to have dimerization. So that's how it works. It doesn't just work on its own. You di the receptor is dimerized. And the preferred partner for HER2 is HER3. So HER2 doesn't have a ligand. HER3 doesn't have a tyrosine kinase domain, but the two together are very powerful. Now, how do you measure this in actual tumor specimens? The way we measure it is usually by immunohistochemistry, where we're looking at the protein on the membrane. So it's membrane, it's usually membrane bound. This is a, an example of a 3 plus, which is very positive for HER2. And then if it's 2 plus or equivocal or some centers like at Jenny Slayman's group and Mike Press, they do fish for everything. Um, so if you have amplification, it's also co is called um, HER2 positive. So this makes a very, very good target for treatment. And this is just an example of all the different areas where you can target. You can target the, the external domain here, which we do with trastuzumab, which I'll talk about. You can target the area which um, is responsible for the dimerization, that, that area. You can use it, an ADC, an antibody drug conjugate, bring in a, a chemotherapy drug 
when you bind to the receptor by specific antibodies um, associated with immunotherapy or immune cells. You can have tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which will affect this part, and HSP90 inhibitors. So those are just some of the ways which you can actually target HER2. And what was the, has been the most successful has been um, these, these first two, which I'll talk about more next. To look at the milestones for any HER2 therapy, I think is interesting before we start going forward. And the EGFR, the HER1, was discovered by Cohen a long time ago. Actually, I was at, the, at Vanderbilt right after that was discovered, and he was at from Vanderbilt in those days. The, these growth factors were really the exciting things. Um, and then a lot of work was done. Um, as I mentioned, Denny Slayman did correlate it with the shorter survival and, and proved that it was a good biomarker. The FDA approved it as a single agent in 1996. So that's a good um, number to remember that that was when it was approved for advanced or metastatic disease, and then the adjuvant setting in 2006. So patients started getting adjuvant trastuzumab in the early 2000s, and then it was approved. Then we had other things approved, lapatinib, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, um, TDM1, which is an ADC antibody drug conjugate, pertuzumab, <coughs> which I'll talk more about, neratinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So we have really had lots of positive um, approvals and improvement in survival for these patients with HER2 positive disease. <clears throat> so just to go through some of that treatment for patients who have metastatic HER2 positive disease, disease first line, that is the first treatment they get, I, I'm going to just throw up this um, case and see if probably if you know the answer to it or not. If, if you're an oncologist, you can't answer, but <coughs> if you're a resident that have, has been rotating through oncology, you, you can answer. So a 56-year-old woman with ER, PR positive, HER2 positive breast cancer. Now she has liver, lung, bone marrow involvement, so she's got extensive disease. She had gotten adjuvant AC paclitaxel with trastuzumab two years ago, finished that. Up, so it's two years after she's completed her adjuvant treatment. So what treatment would you give her? Now, do any of the residents know the answer to this? Because I know you said, Dr. Silverman said some residents had rotated with her. So nobody knows? All right, well, we'll go through, and then we'll see if you know after I, I'm done. So there are five basic subtypes of, of breast cancer that were described by Chuck Peru and the group at Stanford, and actually it was, I think that's a, a typo, it was earlier than 2010, but that's from his later, later publication, it was about 2000. So we talk about breast cancer in these five different subtypes. The luminal A and B are those that are ER positive. The clot and low tend to be more ER negative. The basal like are all ER negative and really are probably a wastebasket term for a lot of different ones that we're figuring out. And then we have HER2. So these are looking at the different gene profiles of these different subtypes of breast cancer. And I think that that is something you're going to see in all the other cancers now too, that you can't just say breast cancer anymore or colon cancer or lung cancer, that there are really many different oncogenes or different types that are driving these cancers. And we're seeing with all these genomics that are being done now, we're picking out the different mutations that cross different cancers, like the TREC mutation is something recently that had an approval. No matter which cancer you had, there's a drug for that specific mutation. So I think it's important that these kind of works being done and to, to pay attention to it. And if you look early, and this is early on, that those patients that had the HER2 um, subtype, you can see how poorly they did. So they had really, really bad survival. The 50, um, the median survival there is um, about 30 months or so, or less, actually, the patients 
um, did much worse than that. So trastuzumab was invented by <coughs> with the help of Denny Slayman. There's lots of backstory on all of that with Genentech, and it's a humanized anti-HER2 monoclonal antibody as shown here. So it's 95% human, 5% murine. Um, and it was put into many clinical trials. The first one was this one that was published by Denny Slayman in the New England Journal, where patients first line again had not had any treatment for metastatic disease, received this with chemotherapy or chemotherapy without it. And it showed a actually a survival benefit, which was surprising. And though in this the study, the median survival is still only about two years, even with trastuzumab. But progression-free survival was clearly a lot better in those patients who got the trastuzumab. They also discovered when they were doing this, because they gave it along with adriamycin or doxorubicin, that there was cardiac toxicity with, when the two were combined, probably because of the HER2 um, and 4 in, in the heart. Is, is the reason why there was cardiac toxicity. But it was really significant in this trial. It was about 27%. But that's kind of the way a lot of things are in oncology. Sometimes you don't know what these side effects are going to be until you actually do it in um, larger groups of patients. Now, there have been many studies trying to make it better than trastuzumab. And I showed you that one of the other ways to get at this um, target is by tyrosine kinase inhibition. So there have been several trials, and these are just three, showing the tyrosine kinase inhibitors versus the trastuzumab. And in every case, the trastuzumab was better. So the tyrosine kinase mechanism of action wasn't strong enough to actually be better. Um, there are studies that combine the two, the trastuzumab and the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, that show benefits. So that also can be done. And one area that I've worked a lot on is here, looking at the combination of trastuzumab and pertuzumab. And I'm going to spend a lot of time on this because I spent, as I said, spent a lot of time with it. Um, as I mentioned, the pertuzumab will prevent the binding uh, or this dimerization of the HER2 with the HER3. And, and they do bind at different sites on the, the HER2 receptor. Now, when we started this, and I started this um, when I was at, let's see if it goes, the, the NCI, some people had done some work um, preclinically showing that the pertuzumab and trastuzumab combination was effective even after trastuzumab treatment. And this is in an animal um, model right here, so the, the um, black dots there after the trastuzumab do show that there's activity even after treatment with trastuzumab. And so we started with a fellow of mine that I was working with there. We did a small trial with pertuzumab and trastuzumab. And also in Spain, another trial was started by Jose Basalga. We were the only two that really were able to get a hold of this um, molecule through Genentech. They actually had a CRADA with the NCI, so it wasn't out there to, for everyone to work with. And what's interesting um, is the, you know, why, why didn't the company want to develop it? Because they thought, well, it's just another monoclonal antibody. It's really, you know, it's not that exciting, so we'll give it to the NCI. That's kind of the way things work. It, it, um, and, but I was lucky to have the opportunity to work with it. And we did a trial and showed about a 20% activity, which wasn't huge, but these were in patients that had been previously treated. And Jose Bethelga showed similar to that. So based on these, these data, we um, wrote a large phase three study looking at patients who are HER2 positive breast cancer, first line. It was an 800 patient study and randomized them to placebo um, trastuzumab with chemotherapy or pertuzumab. And the reason we chose to use chemotherapy is because I didn't show you the preclinical data. There was a lot more activity when used with chemotherapy rather than just the monoclonals alone. Now, this trial <coughs> was 
started in, in the U.S. And, and done in, in the entire world, actually. And we had a very hard time accruing to this trial. And I actually wrote this trial myself with Genentech. Um, and we would talk every month, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're not accruing patients. And one of the reasons people weren't very excited because it's just another monoclonal antibody. But this is a good lesson for researchers out there to not give up if you, you know, you really believe in something. So we didn't, and we accrued. Interestingly, as you can see there, only 16.7 percent of the patients actually came from the U.S. The majority came from Europe and um, Asia. Asia was a very high accruer, and one reason is because they didn't have trastuzumab available for their patients in the, the adjuvant setting. And you can see that about 52-54% um, had not had previous chemotherapy at all in the neoadjuvant or the, the adjuvant setting. The, about 40% had had anthracyclines and about 24-25% had had hormonal treatment. Um, there, as you can see there, and only 10% had had previous trastuzumab, and that's one of the big criticisms of the study because these are different than the kind of patients we would see today. Most patients have had adjuvant trastuzumab where they hadn't here. Now, we, we had quite a few um, releases of the information here, and the first one, as shown there, I actually saw the data in July of 2010 uh, and I was shocked at the benefit. It was a six-month improvement in progression-free survival. For those of you who don't do oncology, that was a lot. We had never seen that in a breast cancer trial. And plus, it was pertuzumab. Well, how could that possibly be? But it, it actually was. And then several times presenting the overall survival data showing that there was an overall survival benefit. And so this is the, the first data that we reported showing the six-month improvement in progression-free survival. And then the final survival analysis was a 16, almost 16-month 16 improvement in overall survival. This has really ne never been seen before for these breast cancer trials to see this kind of survival benefit. So for me, this is just extremely gratifying, showing that we actually stuck to our guns. We did this trial, um, and, and it's really benefited patients remarkably. If you look at those who have had prior treatment, de novo versus not, they, there was a benefit in both groups, and also a question that comes up is ER positive versus negative, and there was also a benefit in, in both of those groups, too. So that without, um, you know, with these kind of chemotherapies or treatments, you always have side effects. So the side effects were really related to EGFR inhibition in the gut, there was a lot of diarrhea, more diarrhea with pertuzumab. There was more rash. There was more mucositis. All those things are the kind of things you see with EGFR inhibition. Now, I just recently presented the end of study survival, eight-year um, survival landmark analysis showing that at eight years, 37% of these patients are alive. Now that. It's truly remarkable because they have metastatic disease. You know, again, this is the longest follow-up of a study showing a survival benefit. And you can see here there are a lot of people that are way out here and the curves seem to be flattening out. So we just did an analysis and submitted the paper a couple of weeks ago to Lancet Oncology um, looking at what are the factors in those patients who actually survive. Um, so hopefully that, that will come out soon. Very similar, this is just the forest plot, again, showing the very similar things to what I showed you before. And then the end of study, progression-free survival, showing, again, there's a flattening of the curve, looking like these patients may potentially actually be cured. There were almost, I think, 60 patients still on study when, when we had to close it in November entirely. Um, so it, it's, you know, if you're not an oncologist, you might not be so impressed, but this is impressive. And when I was talking to Dr. Silverman at the beginning, we were talking about another trial, and she said, we just can't get people on this other trial because nobody progresses. And, and we're both saying, well, that's really a good thing. We're happy about that. <laughs> so it, it, it is, it's very exciting for the patient. Now, one of the big problems 
And I know there are some neurosurgery or neuro-oncology people, I don't know if they're in here, but I heard this morning one of the fellows, for example, these patients do get CNS mets. A third of them do, but they don't die from it usually. And with the Cleopatra study, we showed that the CNS mets came later. So if you have good systemic treatment, then your CNS mets aren't going to seed so much, and that was also shown with one of the other drugs, the TDM1, too. But it's still a significant problem. We have to find better drugs that actually probably add to trastuzumab and pertuzumab that actually will hit the CNS. So these drugs do go in the CNS because you break down your blood-brain barrier. There's reports of responses. But this is probably the biggest single issue and problem with HER2 positive breast cancer now. So if you, I think I see you in the background there. Yes, you're there. So you can solve this problem for us, okay? All right, thumbs up. <laughs> now, we also wanted to look at different prognostic factors and looked at about a million different things in the laboratory of what could predict which patients would respond to pertuzumab or not. And we didn't find anything. HER2 itself was the most important predictor. Um, but we did find that pic 3 ca mutations showed that these patients have a poor prognosis overall. Though, as you can see there, for the, the solid lines or those cases that had mutations, they still have a benefit from pertuzumab, but the, the graphs are lower down, so their prognosis is not as good. So this is another area of research, and recently there was just a drug approved for pic 3 ca mutations, alpelacid, um, and trials are being done now in, a, you know, in combination with the trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and other things to try to improve that and get those curves up for um, these patients. We also looked at TILs, or tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and found that those tumors that had more than 20% TILs had a better outcome when, when they got the pertuzumab, so that's another aspect of HER2-targeted therapy. And the, the question that people come up with a lot of times is, why is your progression-free survival six months, your overall survival 16 months? And it's probably because there is some immunotherapeutic effect from these monoclonal antibodies. We know for sure that there is when you look at preclinical data. So I think it's it's not necessarily a direct cytotoxic effect, but some immune mechanism that is at play and why you have those long tails on the curves. So to conclude about Cleopatra, the overall survival and investigator-initiated PFS were really great. They were maintained after eight years. And I think it's the longest follow-up for first-line treatment of HER2-positive breast cancer, a maximum of, of 10 years in these patients. The safety profile I didn't really show you, but it really was maintained. Some cardiac toxicity, but it was really minimal, and patients don't die now of cardiac toxicity. Um, and it really totally changed the natural history of this disease, so very exciting for the patients. So, I have always also been interested, as we all are as oncologists, having um, good quality of life for patients. And I, as was mentioned by Dr. Salata, I've been interested in cardiac toxicity probably my whole career because we were one of the first groups at the NCI to use anthracyclines in patients with no negative breast cancer. And it always worried me that we were hurting these young women by giving them anthracyclines and potential cardiac toxicity. So I've always been interested in it. And with HER2, um, because of the cardiac toxicity, many of the patients, if they had a lower EF, even a little bit below normal, were not allowed on the trials for adjuvant therapy or metastatic disease. So I always wanted to do a trial in that group and had a really hard time getting anybody to agree to do it, but finally did, um, Genentech agreed. And we did a, a small study called Safe Heart with a young cardiologist and oncologist at our center to look at cardiac safety in patients who had a low EF. And um, this is basically what it was, is our cardiologist maximally treated these patients with the, um, the cardiac meds beforehand, ruled out ischemic disease and, and different things like that. 
and then we treated the patients. And we only had three patients in the, the red line who actually dropped um, and had to come off steady. The, the blue lines are, are what, you know, the patients were all below normal. They're all below 50%, as you can see there. What's interesting, even though we waited for a month or two, a lot of patients' ejection fraction actually came up. Um, and, and were normal. So this was published, and I think that, you know, we do get a lot of queries about it, that if you have a patient and you've got this life-saving treatment that you and their EF is low, you still can do it, manage with a cardiologist. So I think this is an important um, caveat for these patients. We only had two patients that hard, had heart failure symptoms and one that had an asymptomatic decline in her ejection fraction. So that's uh, out of um, 30 patients. So it, it, I think it's pretty significant evidence that we can treat these patients. And Michael, you were at MD Anderson many years ago, published some retrospective data showing similar things there. The other thing that I was always very concerned about was the diarrhea, which could be very significant. And we're seeing a lot more diarrhea with a lot of the compounds, not just in breast cancer, but in general. So it's a it's a big issue that's got to be dealt with too. So um, with Jennifer Gao, who was a fellow with me, an NCI fellow that was working with me, and, and this is also a, a good thing for fellows because I met with the fellows this morning. They were asking, well, how do you you know how do you make it in your career? Well, she I said I'm worried about diarrhea. She goes, okay, I'm going to find something. And she just combed the literature and found crofelomer. And I don't know if those of you who have ever heard of it, but it's used for HIV diarrhea, associated diarrhea. Nobody had ever heard of it. And she found it, a different mechanism of action, and we thought it might really work in this disease because, or in, in this side effect, because, you know, people had just been using loperamide and things like that. And it, it, it's not the greatest thing for patients because they can get constipated and then they have all sorts of problems. So we started this trial with crofelomer. Um, it's not a, a blinded study versus not. And we're almost completed with it now. Paula Pullman has taken it over because Jenny went to the FDA, so she wasn't allowed to do it anymore. But um, I think it, it's, to me, an example for fellows to always pay attention. You know, there's always, there can be something out there that's different that nobody... And we got it funded by Genentech right away because they had never heard of crofelomer. They thought it was really interesting. Um, so a lot of fun to work with. Well, what is crofelomer? It's actually called blood of the dragon. It's a botanical from Peru. And what this company did, NAPO, they, they went to Peru and the indigenous people used to use it for diarrhea, and it comes, it looks like that, you know, this red blood coming from the tree. And what they've done is when you cut, when you tap these trees, you kill the trees, so they have to cut them down, and they've had a program of sustainability where they plant more trees. So it, it's done a lot of good things. It's helped with jobs for the people there, and, you know, they don't just go in and cut them down and leave. So it, I think it's a, also a very nice story. I don't know if it's going to work, but I think it's um, certainly something that we can try, um, and we are trying. So... The, the next thing that we did after we did the Cleopatra study was the um, Berenice study. And the FDA required, with approval of pertuzumab, that the, um, because Cleopatra wasn't using pertuzumab with an anthracycline, that a study be done with an anthracycline. I am not an anthracycline adjuvant with trastuzumab user myself. There's two camps. There's one group that believes in it. I don't know. Are you anthracycline? So she's non-anthracycline. So probably a lot of you are non-anthracycline here then mm -hmm. because of the cardiac toxicity. But we felt because, for example, Memorial uh, Chow Dang, they're very much everybody gets anthracycline. So this was using our standard regimen, dose-dense AC um, Paxol with pertuzumab, trastuzumab, or the European version, the, the FEX um, docetaxel. And what we found, it was a cardiac um, uh, endpoint study that the FDA required as in the phase four setting. And it just showed 
that very few of the patients, only four in that dose dense and none in the cohort B, had um, any events. So it's low. It's very similar to what you would see in the non um, anthracycline. And then we found that the PCR, the pathologic complete response rates, were really high. You know, with the dose dense um, intent to treat was almost 82 percent. Um, with, a, with the other one at 68 percent, so very active as you would expect. And then we looked at intrinsic subtype, that thing that with all the genes that I showed you at the beginning, you divide it up into luminal A, B, HER2, and basal. And we found there that the HER2 enriched, which is the, um, this one, was the greatest number or, or had the highest pass CR rate. But even within HER2, you see a lot of these other subtypes. So you see, again, that there's a lot of work to be done to divide HER2 into even more categories, and people are doing that rather than just these intrinsic subtypes. Now, to follow up with all of this, um, we're looking in the NRG um, at adding a, an immunotherapy, a tezolizumab, a PD-1 inhibitor, um, so it's, it's basically the, using Taxol, Pertuzumab, Trastuzumab with placebo or with the Tezo, and that study is actually ongoing at the, the current time. So we'll see if that actually accrues well and that we get an answer that adding immunotherapy will really help in this setting. Adding another immunotherapy, because I think the Trastuzumab already is and Pertuzumab. So next, to just briefly mention the um, antibody drug conjugate, which this was the one, this is the reason why I couldn't get the Cleopatra study accrued, which it took forever, because everybody was really excited about this compound, trastuzumab amtansine. As you can see here, it's basically Herceptin with three molecules or so of this amtansine, and it, it basically bound as Herceptin would internalized, and then in the lysosomes, you have a enhancing release, which is a microtubule inhibitor. So it, you get all these different mechanisms of action. For one, you decrease the signaling, you've got chemotherapy, you probably have some immunotherapy. And that um, was put in trial compared to lapatinib capecitabine, and it was better, and it was approved as second-line therapy. Um, and now, if patients um, haven't had um, pertuzumab, trastuzumab, they, they might, um, or at least in the adjuvant setting, they probably get pertuzumab, trastuzumab first line, and then get um, this antibody drug conjugate with CDM1. It was compared to pertuzumab, trastuzumab, and it wasn't as good, which is interesting because of the fact that I told you everybody loved this compound and didn't really want to go onto the pertuzumab study. So it was, it's an interesting history of, of drug development. Now what about patients who have these ER positive, HER2 positive disease? Are they a different group? They probably are. When you look at neoadjuvant therapy, they have lower past CR rates. So there's been several trials looking at should we use just hormonal therapy with these anti-HER2 therapies? <coughs> Excuse me. And our teaching had always been, you know, if a patient has an ER positive tumor, they get hormonal therapy until as long as possible. But when HER2 therapy, anti-HER2 therapy came along, it changed it because we use chemotherapy. Well, several trials have tried to answer the question of is it okay just to give, for example, an AI. And in this one trial, they did find it was significantly better and actually a pretty good progression-free survival with the AI, but the problem was a lot of those patients actually also got chemotherapy. So it's very messy data, and some of the early studies showed very poor outcome when you just used hormonal therapy, and this one too, their progression-free survivals were poor. But that being said, you could probably use endocrine therapy with trastuzumab, pertuzumab in a patient who has poor or high um, morbidity, um, and you might not want to give chemotherapy too. I think it's reasonable to give it in, in that situation, but for the most part, it's usually chemotherapy as first choice. As shown here by these ASCO guidelines, which um, were updated a few years ago, showing the first line 
is with pertuzumab, trastuzumab, second TDM1, lots of different things for third line. And then if a patient develops brain mets, local um, therapy with surgery, if their systemic therapy doesn't change, then you, you continue their systemic therapy as is. If it does, um, if they progress everywhere, you obviously change therapy. Now something interesting is that TDM1, there have been a couple of publications showing actually responses in the brain with TDM1. So I've actually done that recently with a patient. Had about a three centimeter brain met. Um, <coughs> she had a very long progression free survival on trastuzumab, pertuzumab. Developed a three centimeter brain met. We resected it. And it was in the cerebellum, unfortunately, so she had some um, toxicity from, I think, just the surgery and an infarct. And now treating her with TDM1 and then and holding off on the radiation for right now because she had a couple other small brain mets too. And it, it actually is effective and if you look up the studies for that. So actually I, I highlighted the answer here. So this is the patient that we talked about and I think everyone would pretty much agree because it's a two year delay between her adjuvant therapy that, um, and hopefully I've convinced you that trastuzumab and pertuzumab would be the right thing for this patient. And I hope nobody would ever choose this for this kind of patient because even if they're really sick, they can very much respond to HER2 targeted therapy. And many of the other therapies we have now, for example, with the um, lung cancer therapies, you know, it's um, what they call it is a Lazarus type effect. You know, some of these patients look like you should send them to hospice, but if you have an effective therapy, they can do extremely well. So what are the future directions for this? And I'm going to go through it pretty quickly, but palbociclib is the other, or the CD4, CDK4-6 inhibitors are the other class of drugs that have really made a difference in oncology. And they um, work also in HER2 positive disease. And this is another area I tried to get people interested in for a long time based on Denny Slayman's data from his laboratory. This is a HER2 positive cell line showing it's very active. And it took a while to get people interested in it, um, but finally they have. And there's other preclinical data showing that, that you can overcome resistance in HER2 positive breast cancer with these CDK4-6 inhibitors. So there's lots of trials ongoing right now, and I made this slide probably a year or two ago, so there are other trials. If you can do it and you have a patient who is your run through everything and you can actually get it paid for, I think it's a good treatment for these patients. I had a patient who had Pertuzumab, trastuzumab had an okay response, not great, um, and then progressed, was put on TDM1, and basically grew, it was one of these patients who like grew through it, had all these nodes, I mean really almost before our eyes, massive amounts of disease on TDM1. So she obviously didn't respond. So we put her on the phase one study with um, palbociclib and 5-FU. I don't know if the 5-FU probably didn't really do anything, but she actually had a, a dramatic response <coughs> and stayed on for over a year. So that kind of tells you the story. This is a highly proliferative tumor. These affect, the CDK4-6 inhibitors affect proliferation. So it's something to think about if you, you know, you're in clinic and you, you could do it and you could get, um, get it paid for because they are pretty expensive. Now there are lots of new agents. Everybody's excited about looking at HER2 targeted therapy because it's been so effective so, and it's such a good target. So there, this is just a <coughs> small list of the, the many, many things if you look at clinicaltrials.gov that are being looked at. I think immunotherapy for HER2 positive breast cancer I already mentioned. Um, I'm just going to run through it really quickly. There's one study that showed a very small 15% response rate in PVL1 positive tumors. Um, so I'm not sure where it's going to go with HER2 positive disease. I think, you know, it certainly needs to be evaluated. The, the data is not real strong early on. And then the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, there are a couple out there that are really interesting too. Catnib is one, and they have actually used to catnib in patients with brain mets and found that the patients actually do pretty well because it gets into the brain. 
they had a study, HER2 climb, that just closed. So we'll see about that drug for these, you know, these unfortunate patients who have brain mets. I think it's a very, very active and good drug. And then neratinib is another very interesting one. I didn't mention HER2 mutations, but those are very uncommon in breast cancer. Maybe 1% actually have the tumors have these HER2 mutations. And most of the mutations are in the kinase domain. So a, a basket study was done with neratinib, um, and this is just the breast cancer cohort, um, where they looked at all these mutations, most of them here in the kinase domain, and they found that the um, response rate at eight weeks was about a third, or 32 or 24 percent with neratinib. So I think that that's an interesting area that's being, had continued research with these tyrosine kinase inhibitors. But it makes sense when you look at where all the mutations are. <clears throat> So finally, the antibody drug conjugates are a very, very hot area in HER2 positive disease. There's lots of them out there, and this is, I think, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. One's already the TDM1 we already talked about. The one that I'm most excited about is trastuzumab durextecan, and I think I heard that you all have a trial open with this. It's DS8201A. It's a Daiichi Sankyo drug, which AstraZeneca just bought it or licensed it, um, and there is a, um, the comparison to what it looks like to um, TDM1. It has about eight of these drugs, these TOPO1 inhibitors, um, bound to it, and it works the same way as I showed you with TDM1. You, get, you dump the chemotherapy into um, the cells or into the tumor cells. And the response rates have really been remarkable for patients who have been heavily pretreated. And this is in HER2 positive, 33%. HER2 low is 28%. HER2 low ER negative, 40%. So they're thinking, they're definitely developing in a HER2 positive disease. Two trials are open. And then also in HER2 low, because they think there's like what they call a bystander effect because you dump the chemotherapy into the cells that also goes to the other um, cells that are HER2 low. So they also have a trial looking at, at HER2 low. So I'm going to, I was just going to really briefly, some of the work I'm doing now is looking at RNA expression using a nanostring profile with breast cancer 360. And we've, we've found um, a composite predictor of past CR. Just to, I'm not going to go through this in detail. And we're looking at modeling um, how we can show responses um, in patients who have past CR. Looking what we've come up with, and others have too, have published that ERB2, ESR1 are very important for predicting past CR, ERB2 being high, ESR1 being low, and then the tumor inflammation score. So I presented this as ASCO, and we're working on all the analysis now. So to conclude, I'd say, and I think I hope I've convinced you that the survival is really, you know, dramatically better for these patients with HER2 positive disease, but it's not, you know, 100% for sure. We have a way to go, and, and, and certainly more work needs to be done. And so I'd like to end by just showing something that I developed when I was the ASCO president, the Women Who Conquer Cancer, and very proud of all the young women that I've been able to support, our group's been able to support by Young Investigator Awards. And again, uh, a tribute to Koki Roberts and hope that we can all work hard into the Burmans um, and not have to see these kind of deaths anymore. So thank you again very much for having me here. Terrific uh, presentation, and uh, it's uh, astonishing to recognize how far you've come in your career, let alone where this field is going. And I think breast cancer, among other malignancies, really <clears throat> does apply the, the uh, concept of personalized medicine these days, and it has to be the case. I was curious about the cardiotoxicity studies, whether or not with our grow aging population of women, uh, that you looked at ejection fractions, or have you ever used in your practice uh, women with ejection fractions that are lower and using some of these therapies? 
Right. I think, you know, the, the safe heart study is exactly that. You know, those 30 patients had low ejection fractions below 50%, so they were abnormal and they would have been excluded from any of the phase three studies, which always really bothered me because this therapy is so effective. And so now in practice, I work very closely with Anna, or uh, um, the team does, Anna Barak, our cardiologist, she maximizes their therapy and we, we will treat patients that have a low EF with the HER2 targeted therapy. Even lower than 40%? Even lower, yeah. Okay. Questions? Any of our oncologists? Keith? Hey, Tom, you know, um, Dr. Berman practiced at the St. Louis Hospital, which was a case Western teaching hospital that closed. They had a clerkship, they had residents, and he was very well loved. And he actually took care of my, my father in law, who had been son in law. And was just a super nice guy, you know, very confident and, and compassionate position. I think he would have really enjoyed your talk. So, again, I want to thank you again very much. Thank you, Tim. Maybe I can ask Paula to make a few comments, please. Putting you on the spot. <laughs> Well, and I think with the HER2 mutations, too, and colon cancer and different things like that, people are looking at that, so you're absolutely right. I think that's why oncology is so exciting right now, because it's not just, you know, it really isn't just breast cancer. As I mentioned, the TREC mutation, you know, the approval for that recently crosses boundaries. For the MSI high patients, you know, using pembrolizumab for those patients. So. I mean, it, it really makes a lot more sense than what at least I trained with just like killing the patient and the tumor with chemotherapy, you know, just kind of a hammer. Now we're really, you know, actually looking at the mechanism and actually acting on it. So it is really, it's, it's very exciting. Okay. So with that, I want to thank Sandra again uh, for a really exciting and stimulating talk. And I think... Even our residents who may not understand all the subtleties, and I don't either, uh, but the field is moving quickly uh, in, in that direction, and personalized medicine in cancer especially is really critical these days in fashioning therapy that's going to be most appropriate for our patients. So thank you very much again.